Oil in the water does the same thing as fresh water. It breaks down that thermal barrier. Now here we used to have, in here, the, the Gulf, the, the, the uh, circuit in the Gulf that came out between Cuba and Florida, it, it goes counterclockwise, it comes out here and joins up with the rest of the Gulf Stream. When the British toy and oil spill happened, this got broken and it no longer comes out between Cuba and Florida and joins up. It was enough to break down the whole Gulf Stream. Now, I've had naysayers say, well, John, there's still a Gulf Stream. There are new fishes in Florida. Well, yeah, they're still in Florida, South Carolina, Georgia. You get the Cape Hatteras, North Carolina, it goes out 200 miles, and that's the end of it. The second most important event in 2,000 years the birth of our Lord Jesus being the most important, obviously. This is it, right here. World War III, that'll be come and go in a few, in a few months or a couple of years. This is, this is going to go on for centuries, many centuries. It will change our way of life. It will change everything on this planet. Now, the, the major governments, I don't know about Zimbabwe, but the major governments know what I'm talking about. They're getting ready. They know there's going to be mass migrations. They know there's going to be war. They know there's going to be famine. And they're getting ready to take care of themselves primarily and do what they're going to do to maintain their power bases. So when I see major things happening in the news, I always keep this in mind. Now, if you're lucky and you talk to them real nice, Command Sergeant Major Page may speak at one of your gigs here. And when he does, I'm going to do a, a Reader's Digest version of how he spent a year of his life, the next 60 seconds. This is only, what, three years ago, Dan, you were in Africa? Two years ago. A year of his life in Central Africa documenting what the Communist Chinese are doing. Now, when these events kick in completely, let's see, Africa here, right? North Africa is basically desert. South Africa... Central Africa has fairly rich soil, plenty of rainfall, a good climate for growing. It's going to be a, a very desirable area when these things fully kick in. The Communist Chinese are colonizing Central Africa. And that's what Command Sergeant Major Page was doing, was documenting that colonization, building highways, waterworks, sewage treatment plants, power generation plants, airports, everything you would need to colonize any given area. The grain growing area of the United States, of North America, will still be growing grain. Maybe not as much, but it'll still be growing grain, and it's going to be even more desirable than it is now. Especially if you've got more than a billion hungry mouths to feed in China. More than a billion. The northern parts of the plains up in Canada where they grow lots of wheat now, I don't know how they're going to come out of this. It's really beyond my knowledge. I don't have a whole lot, real good prospects for how it's going to work out for them. Down here, the, the gardeners I work with and talk to, you, you get this, who's getting their seed catalogs in the mail? It's that time of year, right? You got these zones you, according to temperatures, right? You buy your seeds according to the zone. Well, a lot of gardeners are going up one zone because it's getting cooler, right? Okay, you can say yes. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> If this was a black audience, people would be screaming these answers at me. <laughs> no reservations there. Um, now, this winter we've had, this past winter, is the coldest winter since 1912. Uh, Dr. Deagle was interviewing uh, frequently an author of a book talking about the, the coming ice age, which may be where we're headed. Um, I don't know about that. I do know that we're looking at dramatic changes in precipitation, dramatic changes in temperature, and that the people who we depend on to grow the grains don't have anything to depend on themselves. They're in, they're in really deep trouble. The ones that own their land outright, own their half million to million dollars worth of equipment outright, they have a lot better chance of surviving this. 
the wheat farmer I know out in Kansas, her family's been doing it for a couple of about three generations. They hold back about a two year supply of, of seed so they can grow their wheat no matter what happens. They're gonna be okay. The ones who have a heavy mortgage and, and a lot of equipment to pay for, they're in big trouble. And we're in big trouble because of what's gonna happen with food prices. The beef herd right now, nationwide beef herd, is at the same level it was 60 years ago. 63 years ago, about the early 1950s. We got twice as many people and the same amount of cattle as we had 60 years ago. That'll put pressure on chicken and pork prices as well. <clears throat> Most of the grain in the planet is grown in the Northern Hemisphere. The Southern Hemisphere is not going to be as affected as this, but they don't grow the grain like, like we do up here in the Northern Hemisphere. They simply don't. You look at a, a map of the world, you can see most of the real estate is north of the, of the equator. Now, if you live south of the equator and you grow grain, you're in a really good position because you're going to be getting some good prices for your grain. Uh, I live in cattle country, and um, at the cattle, auctions, uh, cattle auction a week ago, a 250-pound calf was bringing $1,000. Now, that's on the hoof. That's $4 a pound on the hoof. You get ready. That's going to be working its way through the system. Missouri's a big beef state, in case you don't know it. Cattle and horses, both. Now, I don't know how that translates to the supermarket, but $4 a pound on the hoof is going to be dramatic at the grocery store. It'll be breathtaking. <laughs> now, where I am, luckily, luckily I, can, I can buy a cow from one of my neighbors. I know it doesn't have any pesticides or herbicides or growth hormones or any of that silly stuff, and I get good beef. It takes a little bit of doing, but it's worth it. Um, how are we doing on time, Doc? OK. The, well, the part that I always like, and since I'm a radio talk show host, I really like is questions and answers. So let's just jump right in there. I know this is new information for a lot of you, probably for most of you. Yes, sir. Um, his question is, that, are they keeping prices low by putting in filler? Uh, I've heard that. I, I haven't really studied up on it, so I really can't comment on that part of it. Sir. Oh, you want to go another step backwards. Okay. <laughs> um, in my Halliburton over there, I've got a DVD. We're going to be talking science here. What's your first name, sir? Sky. Sky. First name again? Sky. Okay, Sky. We're talking science. And... Um, it's always fun to see these scientists stack up their credentials. Well, I got more letters behind my name than you do. Um, <laughs> arguing with each other. Um, I know we got some St. Charles people here. How many St. Charles people? Okay. I gave, I gave testimony before the St. Charles County Council to try to stop them from putting sodium fluoride in the drinking water 20 years ago. Obviously, unsuccessfully. I didn't have any letters behind my name. But anyway. Um, Let's say, Sky, you're going to draw a paycheck for looking at stars. You're going to be an astronomer. And that's your career path. If you're the supervising astronomer of the United States Naval Observatory, does your career path have any place else it can go? What are you going to do? Supervising astronomer of the United States Naval Observatory. Pretty much the top of the heap when it comes to being an astronomer. This DVD over here, I have a, there's an interview with Dr. Robert Harrington, the supervising astronomer of the United States Naval Observatory, being interviewed in his office in Washington, D.C. at the United States Naval Observatory by none other than Zachariah Sitchin. I know we have a few people here who know who Zachariah is, right? He died about four years ago. Zachariah Sitchin could pick Babylonian and clay tablets and read them just like the Post-Dispatch. I mean, what a guy. You take one look at him and say, yeah, there's a guy who spent 40 years in the library. Uh, <laughs> but what a brain. 
Now Zechariah Sitchin concluded from reading thousands of these clay tablets that about every 3,600 years, a very large planetary sized object comes through our solar system and causes some massive problems. He's interviewing Dr. Harrington, who has reached the same conclusion. And Dr. Harrington has a big white sheet on an easel, and he draws the a little crude drawing of our solar system and the orbit of this 10th planet coming through our solar system. And then he draws a representation of the one from the Sumerian te text, which is basically <coughs> the same thing. In fact, in my, my collection of books, I've got a, a copy of the 1982 World Book Encyclopedia of Astronomy, and in the centerfold, there's a diagram of a our solar system with the nine planets and the tenth planet coming through there. In 1979, 1980, 1981, and, and a little bit of 19... there was some mainstream media attention to the tenth planet having been found. You won't find anything after 83, though. It's, that was it. They cut it off. Articles in the New York Times, World Book Encyclopedia, like I say, and so forth. Dr. Harrington talked about the 10th planet as a matter of scientific fact, not scientific speculation. I'll take that to the bank. I'll stack up his credentials against anybody you want to stack them up against. Supervising astronomer of the United States Naval Observatory. What I've come to find out by reading tens of thousands of pages, ladies and gentlemen, and, and interviewing these Navy veterans, the world we live in is not the world we think we live in. It's in completely different. What we've been told is our history is not our history. I know we have a lot of veterans here. How many veterans we got? A lot of veterans. Here's a quick history lesson for you. The battleship Maine in Havana Harbor, we only found out about 10 years ago, sunk itself. It wasn't sunk by Cuban commandos. The boiler blew up. We know that's a fact now. We went to war because of a ship that blew up on its own. And Patty Hearst's grandpa, William Randolph Hearst, owned, what, 30 newspapers at the time? Remember the main. 19 years later, the, British emb the German embassy in, war in uh, New York was running ads. Don't ride the passenger liner Lusitania. It's carrying weapons of war. It's a legitimate target. Do not be on the Lusitania. Well, about three or four hundred or five hundred Americans booked passage in Lusitania, which was carrying millions of rounds of ammunition. It was in a convoy. As it got close to Ireland, it slowed down and became a target and it was sunk. Off we go to another war. A friend of mine is very close friends with one of Franklin Roosevelt's granddaughters. And Franklin Roosevelt's granddaughter says the following, boy, you know, the family's taking a lot of heat now that almost everybody knows that Grandpa knew about Pearl Harbor months before it happened. Try to tell that to a World War II veteran. The radar was turned off Sunday morning. Yeah, they knew it was coming. My war? Well, Robert McNamara in his, in his autobiography finally admitted that the Gulf of Tonkin incident never happened. <laughs> we got 55,000 names on a black granite wall because of an American warship being attacked in the Gulf of Tonkin that never happened. The Gulf of Tonkin resolution was the authority from Congress to engage in offensive operations in Vietnam. Never happened. We got a 116 year track record of ships being attacked or maybe being attacked or not attacked at all, getting us off to war. Anybody tell me what the USS Truxton is? It's a destroyer. It's a destroyer. Pattern? Coast Guard. Where is it right now? It's in the Black Sea. No, it's a, it's a U.S. destroyer. It's a, it's a real deal. It's a, it's a good looking ship. 
It's in the Black Sea right now in a training operation with those well-known and well-respected navies, the Romanian and Bulgarian navies, which consist of bass boats from Bass Pro. I don't know what they got, you know. <laughs> training operation. Now, I don't know if they got a combat air patrol or not. They, there's, we got Turkey nearby where we, we, maybe some F-15s could fly out of there and fly combat air patrol. I don't know what they've got. I do know it's in harm's way. It's definitely in harm's way, being there right now by itself. Now, I don't, I don't re regard the Bulgarian and Romanian navies as being anything that's going to help our guys. <coughs> I hope nothing happens to those men, and probably women at this point in time. Um, but um, they're quite vulnerable. Quite vulnerable. And with a 116 year track record of success, going off to war because a ship was attacked, or maybe attacked, or not attacked at all, why not do it again? We got a 116 year track record of success, why not go for it? Questions? Everybody here is question in the back? Okay. For those of us who can't move to the Ozarks now, are we high enough above uh, sea level? Or are we too close to the river? That's not the issue. The issue is 1.5 million people with no running, no electricity. It don't matter. My old neighbors that don't have running water are electricity. <laughs> No, we know how to live without it down there, seriously. I understand, but I'm not going to be also having to tread water. Sometimes. No, no, no. Water won't be an issue. Now, parts of St. Charles, and there's, you have to know how to look at a map and, and how to look at the terrain. Much of St. Charles is old river bottom. A lot of it is old river bottom. I see some head shaking. Now, that old river bottom, you could build roads on it, build your ranch tile home, a little hotel or whatever, quick shop. A good size shake, we're going to talk about the New Madrid here for a moment. A good size shake, that old river bottom turns to jello, literally turns to jello, liquefies. So if you live in St. Charles County, two things. You need to know if your home is on old river bottom and a road to get away from there that doesn't cross old river bottom, hopefully. Well, you're high enough above altitude, above sea level, and, and I don't believe there's much old river bottom there that I, that I'm, that I can think of. The farther north you go, the Spanish Lake, you're getting real close to some low, 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 low areas there. Let's talk about the New Madrid seismic zone. And if you call it New Madrid, you know you're not from Missouri. It's New Madrid. There's a town in Sullivan, uh, and not Sullivan, near Sullivan, Missouri. It's spelled J-A-P-A-N, J-Pan. And in North of Rolla, there's a town that looks just like Versailles, France, but it's Versailles. And don't you get it right now? That's <laughs> um, <laughs> the winter of 1811, 1812, there were hundreds of earthquakes. Hundreds of earthquakes. Four of them strong enough to ring church bells in Philadelphia, originating out of New Madrid, Missouri. One of those earthquakes in Mississippi ran backward for a better part of a day. You can, if you know where to look, you can fly over at 2,000, 3,000 feet. You can still see the evidence of that earthquake even today. Of course, in 1811, 1812, there weren't very many Caucasians living in this area, so the, there was hardly any death and, and the property damage was minimal. It got to the point where people would put logs on an east-west uh, line in their yard because the crevasses were opening up on a north-south line. So the earth would start shaking. They'd run up and they'd stand on these logs and hopefully the, the ground wouldn't swallow them up. And when the earthquake stops, they would go back in their little logs that they had. Mm-hmm. Scary times. Now, if you look at a map of the natural gas and oil pipelines that go from Texas to the Northeast, 
We're talking 20 inch, 20 inch welded steel pipe. They go underneath the Mississippi River, many of them right above the New Madrid seismic zone. Now, 20 inch welded steel pipe can't do this. I mean, it can't, you know. <laughs> Toast. My friend Command Sergeant Major Page over here, um, I briefed him about this matter, and I told him that before he even got the briefing himself, everybody here, uh, here of uh, U.S. NORTHCOM, United States Northern Command, it's what, about eight years old now, Dan? Something like that. I said, Dan, they're going to be splitting NORTHCOM east-west in the Mississippi River, they're gonna, and they're going to start doing it right away. All the men, all the equipment, all supplies, all logistics split east-west at the Mississippi River. Now, according to the scientists, the Mississippi River will be 50 to 100 miles wide, 100, 200 feet deep. You don't have bridges across the river 50 miles wide. You don't have bridges across the river 50 miles wide. You don't. So it's a lot easier to split U.S. NORTHCOM now while you got bridges <laughs> than after the fact. And they're doing it right now. And they didn't tell you why, did they, Dan? They just said, we're doing it. Now, if some of you got pens, you can make some notes. Get yourself a topographical map or fly over at 5,000 feet, one or the other. You can see where the river's been in the ages past. And we're on the high side. Okay. Illinois is the low side. Illinois is Southern Illinois is gone. It'll be a lake. In fact, in the summertime, <laughs> in the summertime, a lot of Selenor is very swampy right now, as a matter of fact. It's so low-lying. Um, so that's, that's a good thing. Now, southern Missouri is a different area. Different, you get down to Boot Hill, they're toast. Yeah. In the yellow hat, yes, sir? Correct. Well, Professor McCanning, who's on my show every Wednesday when he can make it, he's written one book exclusively on that, what he calls a pamphlet, which is only 60 pages on it, and another couple other books that are related. Now, the reason he doesn't say when it's coming is because he doesn't know. The reason I don't say is I don't know. NASA sent the Pioneer 10 space probe up in 1979 to a very specific part of space. Now, I was talking about astronomy earlier. We, we think about astronomy, we think about men and women looking through telescopes. Well, they do that, but most of astronomy is mathematics. Astronomers are mathematicians. That's basically what they are. And there's this thing, it's, it's a kind of a convoluted, tongue-twisting word, perturbations. They notice that the outlying planets, especially like Pluto and so forth, would have these erratic movements at a certain point when they were make it going through their orbit. They'd do this thing, this perturbation. And they, they knew, because that's their responsibility, they knew that that's caused by something out there affecting it. So NASA sent the Pioneer 10 space probe looking for this object in 1979. They found it, and they've been tracking it ever since. Now, the government, and people say, oh, the government can't keep secrets. Yeah, they can keep secrets. Don't fool yourself. Oh, yeah, they can keep secrets. <laughs> my grandfather and my, and my dad, before my dad got drafted in World War II, they both worked on the uh, Manhattan Project in Oak Ridge, Tennessee. And they both got these nice certificates signed by President Truman. Yeah, in your dreams. A nice certificate signed by President Truman thanking him for working on the Manhattan Project. They didn't have a clue what they were working on. Not a clue. And then the other quarter million people didn't either. <laughs> um, the better answer for your question, what's your first name, sir? Randy. The better answer for your question, sir, is we're feeling the effects right now. We're feeling the effects right now. On March 24th, 2014, the weather is becoming quite erratic erratic to the point where it's just, it's just bonkers crazy. 
It used to be that if a, play, if a community got 20 inches of rain 24 hours, it made big news. It doesn't anymore because it happens too frequently. We've had entire forests knocked down by straight line winds. That's a jet stream coming down the surface of the planet. That's not supposed to happen. In fact, we had that here in Missouri. In fact, we had a um, great story. You'll appreciate this. Anybody uh, go to Skywarn class here? Probably one, only one Skywarn guy? Two? Okay. Same, well, similar. Skywarn is where everyday people are given specific training, typically by a, a NOAA scientist, on how to observe weather accurately and report back to the county headquarters their observations. That's what Skywarn is. My friend Ann Morris is on with me every Friday. She's a scientist and an engineer. She was at a Skywarn class here in, in St. Louis County in Clayton about six or eight weeks after Hurricane Katrina. So they're all learning their stuff about clouds and wind and so forth, precipitation. And the instructor was a young NOAA scientist, a young, a young man who could be her son, about 35, 36 years old, brilliant young man. So they're in the hallway on a break, and the topic turns to hurricanes. You know, we just had Hurricane Katrina, kind of, you know, topical thing. The young scientist makes the following statement. Just wait until you start seeing these hurricanes forming over land. Oh, yeah? Try to graduate from meteorology school and even think that can be possible. Now, Ann knew exactly what he was talking about. She tried to ask a follow-up question. The young scientist, till the brain finally kicked in, oh, my pension, my paycheck might go out the window. I can't say anything. In May of, was it four years ago, we had a hurricane move across Missouri from Oklahoma. I was in it. You remember it? That can't happen, but it did. A hurricane, now here's what you have to have a, have a hurricane. You have to have a storm that has a counterclockwise swirl, it has to have a well-formed eye, and it has to have sustained winds of 75 miles an hour. If it's got those three things, it's a category one hurricane. It had all three of those things, and even the FM commercial station out of Rolla, Missouri was calling it a hurricane while it was going on. That can't happen. You can't have hurricanes forming over land. Yeah, forming over the water, but, not, but they're now happening, aren't they? If you become a student of Professor McKinney, as, as I have, you'll find out why. Now, those of us who live in the Ozarks, we, we have a, a saying. We, we refer to mobile home parks as tornado magnets. Anybody hear that expression? Okay, we've all heard it. Her, mobile home parks, tornado magnets. How, how many hand operators we got here? One, two, okay. A ground plane antenna is a flat piece of metal. That's what a ground plane antenna is. What's a mobile home? What happens when you put a whole bunch of mobile homes really close to each other? You create a very large ground plane antenna. So that a tornado's going along, going along. It gets the, the, tar the mobile home parks over here. It does a 90 degree turn and goes straight towards it. They got this reputation for being a tornado magnet before we understood the science. Now, if you read Professor McCanny's work, you'll find out that all cyclonic storms, tornadoes, hurricanes, cyclones, they're all electrical in nature, all of them. And electricity's going bonkers too. Yes, ma'am. Oh, Teresa. You're, okay. Good to see you, my dear. What's on your mind tonight? 